Koto. Okay, to Pihia Mato, how are we all doing? Ko Jeff Booth Toko Ingoa. Pastors David and Linda have afforded me the great honor of bringing the Word of God to us today, and we're going to get to that in a moment. But firstly, on this Father's Day, let me take a moment to give a big sh- shout out to all of our dads. <laughs> I remember when my children were young. I used to try and remind them that they, in fact, had two fathers. I was their earthly father, dad with a little d, but they also had a heavenly father, dad with a big d. And I felt it was my responsibility, in fact, I still do, as an earthly father to point them toward their heavenly father. And so I'm praying today for those of you who find yourselves right in the years of raising children that by God's grace you may be able to raise them, as the Bible says, in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. So the Lord bless you today. The word that I'd like to share with us today is a word that's been on my heart for a while. And it's a word that's been a great source of encouragement to me personally, a source of great comfort, a great, of great hope, a word of great help to me. And I believe it's going to be so for many of us today. 
It's a word that comes from Genesis chapter 41 verse 52. It's a word that relates to the explanation of the meaning of the name Ephraim, which is the name that Joseph gave to the second son that was born to him in Egypt. So for a little bit of context, let's go to the narrative now and begin reading from Genesis chapter 41, verse 46. I'm reading today from the NIV, where we read, Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from Pharaoh's presence and traveled throughout Egypt. And during the seven years of abundance, the land produced plentifully. Joseph collected all the food produced in those seven years of abundance in Egypt and stored it in the cities. In each city he put the food grown in the fields surrounding it. Joseph stored up huge quantities of grain, like the sand of the sea. It was so much that he stopped keeping records because it was beyond measure. Before the years of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph by Asenath, daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh and said, It is because God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. The second son he named Ephraim and said, It is because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. The seven years of abundance in Egypt came to an end, and the seven years of famine began, just as Joseph had said. There was famine in all the other lands, but in the whole land of Egypt there was food. When all Egypt began to feel the famine, the people cried to Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh told the Egyptians, Go to Joseph and do what he tells you. When the famine had spread over the whole country, Joseph opened the storehouses and sold grain to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe throughout Egypt. And all the countries came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph, because the famine was severe in all the world. So now we find Joseph, perhaps now in his mid-thirties, he's married, he has two boys, Manasseh and Ephraim. But circumstantially, the years that Joseph had been in Egypt, which were perhaps almost two decades now, had been very difficult years, and Egypt had been for him a land of suffering. As a young man, perhaps 17 or 18 years of age, Joseph had suffered at the hands of his siblings. Through their intense jealousy and hatred and murderous intent, Joseph found himself in this foreign land. And in this land of Egypt, he was subject to all manner of difficulty, a subject to domestic servitude. He was subject to great temptation, to false accusation, to wrongful imprisonment, to injustice, to betrayal and disappointment. So in, in every sense, Egypt had been for Joseph a land of suffering. But that was only part of Joseph's story, and it certainly wasn't the end of his story. If it had been so, if suffering had been the end of the story, then we could well have expected Joseph to have languished in the land of Egypt and to have died a very angry and admitted old man. But not so. Why? because God was with him. Even in the midst of his suffering, God was at work in Joseph's life, not only to prosper him personally, but ultimately to save his whānau and to save a nation, the nation to which he belonged. So the presence of the Lord was with him, even though he was going through these difficult years. So now Joseph in his mid-thirties, as he looks back over those years, from this perspective, recognizes that even though those years were difficult, and even though Egypt had been for him a land of suffering, that God was with him. 
and working out his good purposes. Well, in what sense could Joseph say that his life had been fruitful? Certainly having a wife and two boys was a measure of his fruitfulness. Fano or family had of course been a source of great heartache for Joseph. And in a very real sense, he had been lost to his family and his family, his birth family, had been lost to him. But you get a sense that through these years, God had been at work healing Joseph's heart. And that was going to be necessary if Joseph was to become the instrument of restoration for his family and as an instrument in the salvation of his people. So Joseph could say, I've been fruitful in that area. God has made me fruitful in this arena of family life, now with a wife and two children. But he was also fruitful in terms of his relationship with God. Throughout the difficult years in Egypt, Joseph had maintained a belief in the God of his father Jacob, his grandfather Isaac, and his great-grandfather Abraham. At every point, Joseph sought to acknowledge God and to honor God. And I think for Joseph, there was a, a growing awareness and a growing understand, a growing understanding of the purposes of God and why God brought Joseph to Egypt, albeit in the manner in which it happened. So Joseph was fruitful in terms of his relationship with God. And not surprisingly, we find him fruitful in terms of the activity of the Spirit of God in and through Joseph's life. Even his Egyptian master, Potiphar, recognized that in some way Joseph was special, that the Spirit of God was active in his life in a very special way. Wairua Tapu is described as the Spirit of wisdom and of revelation. And it was only by virtue of the activity of the Spirit of God in Joseph's life that he was able to interpret the dreams in the way that he did. And it was also through the Spirit of wisdom that he was able to offer a strategy uh, to the governance of his day for the effective management of the nation's resources through a season of famine that was coming. And so we find that Joseph was, was fruitful in terms of the activity of the Spirit of God in his life. But he was also very fruitful in terms of the favor that God had given him in the land. And with, with whomever he had to do, we find that Joseph was given favor. He was given favor with his master, his Egyptian master, Potiphar. He was given favor during his term of imprisonment with the prison warden and he was given f favor with pharaoh the king of egypt not surprisingly we find because of that favor that joseph is given increasing levels of responsibility it is said that potiphar put all of the management of his home his fields and all of the affairs of his household solely under joseph during his term of imprisonment, we find that the prison warden put all the other prisoners under the charge of Joseph, and Joseph cared for them. Pharaoh put all the affairs of the state of Egypt under his management, and he gave to him the position of prime minister, a position of great honor, a position of great power, a position of great prominence and, and privilege, in the land of Egypt. I think of great significance though, in the land of his suffering, Joseph was fruitful in terms of character. As God worked in him, grew in him, the very character and the very nature of God himself. And it was through those years in the land of suffering that Joseph grew into a man of integrity, into a man of faithfulness, into a man of compassion, into a man of humility. And perhaps it was in that area that he needed, certainly needed to grow character. 
So in every sense, as Joseph looked back on his life, he could say that the Lord has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. <laughs> what I love about this story is that it is so God. It is so God. And what I believe God is saying to each and every one of us today is this, that I am making you fruitful in the land of your suffering. I am at work in your life to increase the level of your fruitfulness, even in this painful time that you're going through. Now, I don't know what the land of suffering represents for you today. For some of you, you, you may not feel you're in that space at all. Well, that's cool. Pray for those who are. But at some point in our lives, all of us find ourselves in a land of suffering. And you may be in that place today. You may be in a very painful season, in a very difficult place. For you, it, it may be trying to make a marriage work. For others of you, it may be related to parenting, trying to be a good dad or a good man and raise kids in a very confused world. Perhaps for you, your land of suffering is related to your personal health right now, maybe uh, living with a disability or an injury or a, a very serious diagnosis. Maybe that is your land of suffering. Maybe it's related to mental health or to emotional well-being. Perhaps it's related to a financial area or something that's happening in your relational world or your business life. Perhaps it's dealing with failure or dealing with disappointment. Perhaps it's dealing with isolation or a sense of loneliness. Or perhaps it's, as Pastor Linda described last week, dealing with the sense of confinement and the sense of being in some way shackled. Well, whatever the land of suffering is for you, I think what the Lord is wanting to say to us today and remind us that it's in this place, as we dwell in this place, in the land of suffering, that God is with us. God is working in our lives to make us fruitful, even in the midst of this season. Suffering was not the end of the story for Joseph. And friends, suffering is not the end of your story, and it's not the end of my story. Because God is at work. God is with us and God is at work in us to bring us into a new level of fruitfulness, even in the midst of our trial. When Joseph was in prison, confined by circumstances beyond his control, the narrative says that the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. And the Lord was kind to him and gave him favor. Well, for you and I, what is the, the fruit that our lives might bear while we walk the rough terrain in the land of suffering? For many of us, it's a greater awareness of the, the tangible reality of God's presence with us in the land of suffering. In the good times, it's easy for us to give academic assent uh, to the fact that God is with me. And I can say that in the good times. But friends, it's when we walk the rough terrain of the land of suffering that we, we discover and we become perhaps more aware of the reality of that truth. That yes, God is with me. God is with me in a very real and tangible way. In the land of suffering. It's in the land of suffering that we, we have a greater experience, I believe, of his love, of the goodness of our Father, of, of the, the, a greater experience of the God of comfort as he ministers to us in our pain, a greater sense of his grace at work in our, in our lives, enabling us to endure a greater sense of healing, a greater sense of, of him at work bringing restoration 
It's in the land of suffering that those things become so real to us. I believe it's in the land of suffering that character is refined. There are some qualities that only grow in the rough terrain of the land of suffering. And we've referenced those already. Qualities like patience, qualities like perseverance, qualities like humility and compassion grow best in the land of suffering. But so do all the other qualities that Pastor Linda described for us so well last week. Perhaps for you, the land of suffering is the place where God is wanting to bring a change of lifestyle where you and I might live in a manner that is more consistent with the Word of God, more consistent with the wisdom of God, more consistent with the will and the ways of God. Perhaps for you the land of suffering is the place where God wants to increase your influence to give your life a greater impact for Jesus Christ in the life of others as He sharpens us is instruments of his blessing in the lives of others, as instruments of the outworking of his purposes in the lives of others. So there's many ways in which we could sense that our lives are fruitful, even in our most difficult trial. Well, perhaps that's enough said for today. May you be strengthened by this word and may this be your testimony that the Lord has made me or is making me fruitful in the land of my suffering. May the place of your greatest pain be the place of your greatest gain. I wonder if I can close by a word of prayer together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love for your kids. Thank you that your word is living. And thank you that a word recorded thousands of years ago has the power to change our lives today. Activate this word in the hearts of all who need it as we receive it and believe it. Forgive us, Lord Jesus, for focusing so much upon our pain that we have lost sight of you and what you are doing in our lives. Thank you that you are at work in my life to make me fruitful in every season, even the painful ones. Thank you that my place of great pain will be through you the place of my greatest gain. Lord Jesus, I bless your people. Mateatu Koto. Emanaki. Pour out your love, pour out your peace, pour out your comfort, pour out your grace, pour out your healing, pour out your protection on every heart today as we pray in the name of Ihukariati. Amen. Amen. If I can just conclude with this word by way of a postscript. The story of Joseph is an amazing story of restoration. As you read on in the story, we find that Joseph is fully restored to his family. But in many ways, it's a picture also of our lives. Because of sin, you and I find ourselves in a strange land, disconnected, separated from our Heavenly Father. And to be honest, friends, this is the land of our greatest suffering. But deep in our hearts, there is this longing, there is this desire for our relationship to be restored, to know our Father, to be reconnected to Him, to be reunited with Him, to come home in a sense, and to find our true identity and meaning in relationship with Him. And the beautiful th story of the gospel is this, that our Father has provided for each and every one of us a way home through his Son, Jesus Christ. See, on the cross, Jesus 
endured the greatest pain known to humanity. As a sinless Son of God suffered and died in your place and in my place. For him, the cross was also the place of his greatest gain. As he was raised to life and his father gave to him a name that is above every name and exalted him, he also gained a bride, you and I. But friends, the good news of the gospel is that not only was that place of Jesus' greatest pain, also the place of my greatest gain. The opportunity of a relationship restored. So that's the good news of the gospel that your Father in heaven offers you this gift today. And I don't know that many of you have received, have accepted this gift, the gift of a restored relationship through faith in Jesus Christ and the indwelling work of the Spirit of God. But if you haven't, can I make an appeal to you today? Please accept this gift. Believe in your heart in Jesus Christ that what he did on the cross, he did for you and receive him. Perhaps I can offer uh, this short prayer to help us. It might go something like this. Heavenly Father, I believe that what Jesus did, he did for me. I receive him now. I turn away from my old life and I follow you. And I invite him into my life to be my Saviour and Lord. I ask that you fill me with your Holy Spirit that I may walk in this new life. So friends, from our fari to your fari, from our hearts to your hearts, aroha nui, matewa. Thank you.